Well, hello, everyone. I am Dave Finkelstein, a vice president here at CNA and director of CNA's China and Indo-Pacific Security Affairs Division. On behalf of our president and CEO, Dr. Catherine McGrady, I welcome you to today's national security seminar examining the foreign policy, technology, and military implications of the 20th National Congress of the Chinese Communist Party. Today's event is being recorded and will be available on our site. And we will follow up with a link if you would like to share it with any colleagues who could not join us today. And of course, there will be an audience Q&A period towards the end of the event. So feel free to send in your questions. Now, if you're participating through Zoom, you can send your questions through the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And if you are alternately calling in, you can email your questions to CNA underscore NSS at CNA.org. So uh, by way of introduction, CNA is an independent nonprofit research institute comprised of the Center for Naval Analyses and the Institute for Public Research. The Center for Naval Analyses, of course, is a federally funded research and development center sponsored by the Department of the Navy that supports decision makers across the Department of Defense and other US government organizations. The Institute for Public Research supports national level non-defense agencies and state and local governments in such critical areas as homeland security, digital transformation, emerging technologies, public safety, public health preparedness, and emergency operations. Overall, since 1942, CNA has been very proud to support the national security and national safety of the United States of America. And as I mentioned earlier, I have the privilege of directing CNA's China and Indo-Pacific Security Affairs Division with over three dozen China and Asia analysts looking at this critical region of the world, we are working every day to provide our US government sponsors and the public with the insights needed to make informed decisions. Now, this program series, the CNA National Security Seminar, brings together subject matter experts from across government, academia, research institutes, the private sector, and on occasion, US partner nations to share expertise and contribute to an ongoing dialogue about issues affecting US national security. Earlier this year, our programs have looked at China's economic activity in the Arctic, uh, the use of drones in the war in Ukraine, critical mineral supply chains, and the recent protests in Iran. Today, we are absolutely delighted to have as our guest moderator, National Public Radio's Beijing correspondent, Emily Feng joining us virtually from Indonesia, by the way, where she has been covering the G20 summit. Emily has been with NPR since 2019 and has extensive experience traveling around and reporting from China, previously serving as a foreign correspondent with the Financial Times. She has covered topics uh, as diverse as human rights in Xinjiang, uh, technology development issues in China, social issues, and environmental affairs. Emily was recently awarded the prestigious Shorenstein Journalism Award, which recognizes outstanding journalists who have spent their entire careers helping audiences to understand the complexities of the Asia Pacific region. She has also been the recipient of the Human Rights Press Awards and other, other accolades over these many years. A cum laude graduate from Duke University, I am personally a great fan of her work and many of her colleagues at NPR. So welcome, Emily, and over to you. Thank you, David. That's a very kind and very warm introduction. I'm, I'm thrilled to be able to moderate this panel, which is a very interesting topic, the implications of the 20th Party Congress. We've all had now about a month to digest the party report and to understand its implications. I find it um, fitting that right now, probably local officials at the provincial and the city level are also studying the party report and how it applies to their work and uh, reading it over and over and over again and interpreting it for how it might apply to what they do day to day. So it's fitting that uh, we are looking at its implications with regards to foreign policy, military implications, uh, and, and U.S. policy. 
And the party Congress has been particularly interesting this time around because it happens at um, a time when tensions with the US, with Taiwan, with other countries have been incredibly high when the econ economic might of China has been has been rising despite its zero COVID restrictions and some economic stumbles along, uh, along the last two years. Um, but the party Congress also happened at an interesting time vis-a-vis -vis US policy. It's been bookended by the release of first the US national security strategy and then after the party Congress, our national defense strategy. So it's interesting to read these documents, I think in conversation with one another to see how all three talk about essentially massive external challenges that are facing both countries. And they lay out a very, very clear strategy about how each country uh, prioritizes its issues and wants to go about solving them. A lot of the text is of course aspirational, uh, so it'll be us, I think, in the coming months or years to make sense of how much is actually practical and how we realize those goals. With that, um, I would like to introduce the panelists who uh, are far more qualified to answer these questions than I am. This is in no uh, order whatsoever. I think this is probably the order in which they'll speak. Um, but first, let me introduce Elizabeth Wishnick, who is uh, going to talk about the foreign policy implications of the 20th Party Congress. Elizabeth is a professor of political science at Montclair State University. She uh, focuses on foreign policy and non-traditional security. So she's working on two very interesting book projects, one under contract at Columbia University Press on, on uh, oil, water, and food risks in China. Interested to read that. And another uh, for the Strategic Studies Institute at the US Army War College on China's interests and goals in the Arctic, an undercover topic. Then we have David, who has kindly introduced me and started this event, Vice President at CNA. He has a PhD in Chinese and Japanese history from Princeton University, very, very impressive, and has studied Mandarin at Nankai University in Tianjin. He's a member of the National Committee for U.S.-China Relations and the International Institute for Strategic Studies. He is a retired U.S. Army officer and a graduate of the United States Military Academy at West Point. Uh, and consistently, I find you, David, to have some of the best access to information about the goings-on in the Chinese PLA. So thank you very much for all your help in the past. And then last but not least, we have April Herlevy, who is an expert in China's foreign economic policy and economic statecraft, who will talk about the economic implications of the Party Congress. Uh, she researches the intersection of economics and national security and how Chinese commercial, economic, and military actors project their influence globally. Uh, she um, has um, gotten her PhD at UVA and has studied in um, uh, studied Mandarin at Tsinghua University in Beijing, as well as Zhejiang University of Technology in Hangzhou. Um, she's also served in various positions across the U.S. Navy, the Marine Corps, and the U.S. Agency for International Development. So a diverse range of experiences uh, over the next 90 minutes, I, uh, give or take, on these topics. Just kind of a quick roadmap of how the event's going to go. The first 30 minutes, April, Dave, and Elizabeth are going to share their thoughts uh, on, on their assigned topics. Then we'll open it up for conversation between the three speakers. And then the last 30 minutes, approximately, the audience gets to ask questions and, and I will help moderate to streamline that conversation. So without further ado, I hand the floor over to Elizabeth. Thank you, Emily. Um, so I'm very pleased to be with you today to discuss this important topic. I'm a senior research scientist in the China and Indo-Pacific uh, Studies Division at CNA. And I'm going to talk to you about the continuities and changes uh, that uh, Xi developed in his report to the 20th Congress. Uh, so the report shows some continuities from his previous uh, speeches and statements on foreign policy. and uh, some uh, it has some commonalities with some concepts from his predecessors, uh, predecessors, but it's notable for its emphasis on what he calls holistic national security. And as well, um, he, he discusses his global security initiative, which he just um, unveiled earlier this year. And so um, what I'm going to argue today in my comments is that uh, his statements on national security and on global security highlight his preoccupation with risk management, especially political risks and risks to regime security that he feels, as well as his determination uh, for China to participate in global rulemaking. Um, the report also reflects Xi's assessment of the global security situation, which is a topic that Dave 
will address uh, subsequently. What everyone wants to know ab about this report is what it means for Chinese foreign policy specifically. But this document actually tells us very little about specific uh, foreign policy uh, orientations. It's not a programmatic document uh, like the US State of the Union address. Um, there's nothing in it, for example, uh, to answer the, uh, the hot question that everyone has, which is if and when China will invade Taiwan, uh, that we can uh, speculate about that in the Q&A later. Um, however, uh, we, what we can see is some uh, recent foreign policy developments just after uh, the Congress, uh, which give us some hints about how she plans to implement these concepts that he has outlined in his, in his speech. Um, so first I'm gonna briefly cover some areas of continuity, and then I'm gonna talk about two areas of change in this report. And in my conclusion, uh, talk briefly about some recent foreign policy developments. So in terms of continuity, she begins his report by highlighting the achievements of the previous decade. And he lists the Belt and Road Initiative as one of them and claims it has been welcomed by the international community as both a public good and a cooperation platform. He also talks about major country diplomacy and China's commitment to true multilateralism as well as to what he calls modernized peaceful development. And he also mentions a long, long-standing principle of Chinese foreign policy, which is the adherence to the five principles of peaceful coexistence. So these are some continuity, some concepts we have heard prior uh, in prior speeches by Xi and by his predecessors. Um, but what is distinctive about this report um, is that uh, she outlines two new sets of foreign policy goals. One is to further consolidate national security. And I will discuss in a moment what he means by that. And second is to increase China's international standing and to enable it to play a much greater role in global governance. So first on national security, uh, he spends a lot of time in this report talking about uh, what he calls holistic national security. And national security is mentioned 31 times in this report. So it, it's, a, it's a, an extensively discussed subject. And what's interesting about it is that it's really an, a national uh, plan. It's about domestic uh, risks rather than foreign policy. And uh, holistic national security sees uh, regime security and the and the stability of Communist Party rule as the, as the key to China's security, but also goes on to discuss potential military threats and non-military threats. So in terms of the ranking of threats, political security, regime stability, and party supremacy are the fundamental tasks. And then below these tasks, we have uh, 14 different pillars and they include issues such as societal security, by which he means uh, domestic stability, technological security, which April will discuss in her comments, and then various non-military threats like ecological security, resource security, health security. And interestingly, uh, he also mentioned some global commons issues like space, uh, polar security, and deep sea security which shows uh, she's global ambitions here. So economic security is, is listed as the foundation to all of this. Um, but interestingly, international security, so the, the meat and potatoes of foreign policy is seen as a support. So this is, this is very much a domestically driven foreign policy agenda. Um, the second uh, new area in this report refers to uh, Xi's Global Security Initiative, which he unveiled in April at the BOA Forum. And if the national security uh, agenda is more domestically driven, the Global Security Initiative explains how uh, she hopes China will, will play a role in the world. And very much uh, 
a key element of this is uh, Xi's effort to contrast China's foreign policy with what he calls US bloc politics and Cold War mentality. So the Global Security Initiative claims on the one hand to respect the sovereignty and territorial integrity of all countries, um, but uh, also points out that security is indivisible and that states are part of a community of common destiny. So this is a, a this last state, this last concept comes from Hu Jintao, um, but uh, she puts it in the broader context of his global security initiative. And he notes that uh, we have to focus on common security on the basis of equality and mutual respect and follow the UN charter and its, and its uh, requirements for peaceful resolution of disputes. Uh, so this, this all sounds uh, wonderful, uh, but how does it work in practice? Uh, so if we look at some recent developments right after the Party Congress, we have some um, idea of how uh, she plans to implement this type of approach to foreign policy. So U.S.-China relations have been in a tense period in recent years. And in the report, she does mention uh, not discussing the U.S. directly, but he, he says that China stands firmly against all forms of hegemonism and power politics, cold, the Cold War mentality, interference in other countries' internal affairs, and double standards. So we all know what he's talking about there. Um, but right after the Congress, he sends a letter to the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations, where uh, he uh, urges the U.S. and China to strengthen communication and cooperation and to uh, work towards global stability and uh, peace and development. And then he meets with Biden on the sidelines of the Bali uh, G20 summit that Emily was covering. And um, he ha they have some uh, difficult discussions on the one hand, each side reiterates its own positions, but uh, there are some uh, aspects of cooperation that emerge from there. So, so we see, um, we see she standing by his uh, criticisms, but on the other hand, uh, trying to open up some type of communication there. Uh, what about Russia? Uh, well, there's been a lot of discussion since the onset of Russia's war in Ukraine about whether or not there might be an alliance with China, uh, between China and Russia, or if the, the war would fray their relationship. Well, China, um, in, in this report, claims to pursue an independent policy. So that's been the longstanding policy, no alliances. Um, but in this Global Security Initiative, you see some of the language that China uses on Ukraine, that, that the legitimate security of uh, interests of all states should be respected, and uh, that security is indivisible. Um, and so um, just uh, one more point on this Global Security Initiative. Uh, so what does this mean in terms of how China is going to pursue global security? So what, what some experts have said is that uh, this will be Chinese style security. For example, we've seen Chinese efforts to train security forces in certain countries uh, uh, to promote the use of surveillance technologies and to pr promote a certain vision of, uh, of cybersecurity via its digital Silk Road. So I'll just conclude there that um, in this report, we've seen some continuities with previous positions China has outlined on foreign policy, but also two new approaches in the national uh, security agenda, holistic national security agenda, which prioritize domestic risks, and the global security initiative, which promotes a Chinese style uh, approach to security and um, uh, uh, globally. So thank you. I'm going to stop there. Thank you, Elizabeth. David, do you want to take it away? Uh, yes. Uh, well, well, thanks, Emily, and thanks, Liz. So with the 20th Party Congress almost one month behind us, the dust has settled a little bit, and there's been some time for reflection in order to get past the headlines and instead place 
the military and international security aspects of the Congress into a larger context. And for the purposes of my short introductory comments, I have chosen to highlight what I consider to be the uh, two important takeaways from the Congress. So here are my bottom lines up front. Uh, the first is the policy guidance to the military at this Congress strongly suggests that going forward, the PLA is going to be even more operationally oriented in attempting to shape the security situation along its periphery. And second, Xi Jinping offers the Congress a very worrisome assessment of Beijing's external security situation that is going to provide the context for future decisions on foreign and security policy. So let me begin with military and defense affairs. So first, uh, this Congress revalidated the fundamental and unprecedented military modernization and reform program that was launched back in 2016. What kind of PLA is Beijing seeking? seeking? Well, since coming to power in 2012, Xi Jinping has directed the PLA uh, to become a force that is one, more red politically, two, more joint operationally, three, more expeditionary in reach, and four, more high tech in emerging domains. But now with this Congress, a fifth attribute, fifth, a PLA, I believe, that is being told to be more forward leaning operationally. More on this point later on. Second, the report to the Congress conveys to the PLA a sense of urgency in achieving its modernization objectives. The same sense of urgency that was imparted at the fifth plenum in 2020, when the PLA was told to accelerate its march to the attainment of world-class standards by 2049. In this report, the PLA is urged to, quote, work more quickly, work faster, make unremitting efforts, and intensify efforts to move modernization forward and focus on making progress to meet its near, mid, and long-term modernization goals. And the Congress put special emphasis on the PLA attaining its near-term goals for 2027, which we can talk about later on. So then, why this sense of urgency? Well, one can only speculate. But this sense of urgency may be linked to Beijing's increasing worries about its external security situation, which I will address further on. Now, third, and finally on the military side, and this one I think is quite important from my perspective, the party seems to be giving the PLA guidance to be more operationally oriented going forward. This was suggested in the political report itself and in the PLA's post-Congress propaganda blitz. For example, Xi Jinping's Congress report calls for the PLA to be able to do three things simultaneously. One, become better at deploying on a regular basis. Two, maintaining preparedness for future contingencies. And three, doing the first two while continuing to modernize. And the report states that this is necessary in order to shape, quote unquote, the PRC's security environment, deter and manage crises, and win local wars. Now, former CMC Vice Chairman General Xu Qiliang reinforced this operational focus in a People's Daily editorial on November 7th, writing that, in his words, for the next five years and perhaps even longer, the PLA must focus on fighting, preparing for contingencies, and modernizing all at the same time. And General Xu added that the PLA should fight for every inch of land on issues involving national sovereignty and national territorial integrity. And of course, he means uh, maritime as well, not just land, although that's the term he used. So question. Uh, does this language mean that the PLA is preparing to launch some sort of conflict in the near term? Uh, my answer is only the PLA knows the answer to that, so I don't. But what it does likely mean is that the PLA is being reoriented again to an operational mindset, one parenthetically, that actually comports with how they have been operating along their periphery for the last couple of years. Moreover, my own view is that this language and verbiage also conveys that the PLA's traditional 
binary mindset of either being in a wartime mode or a peacetime modernization mode is no longer their reality. They have to be prepared on all fronts. This operational reorientation and the sense of urgency imparted in the report to the Congress also, I think, comports with rising concerns in Beijing about their external security environment. So let's turn to that. A striking feature for me of Xi Jinping's political report to the Congress was the sense of rising concern, some might even say anxiety and uncertainty that he conveyed when describing the PRC's external security situation. Whereas Xi Jinping's report to the Congress conveyed a sense of triumphalism when enumerating all of the parties and PLA's progress since the 19th Congress in 2017, the report's discussion of China's external security situation conveyed a sense of rising trepidation. And of course, uh, if you've read the report, uh, you've seen some of the key statements. Uh, the very first paragraph talks about grave, intricate international developments and a series of immense risks and challenges. The report also speaks to drastic changes in the international landscape, especially, and this is a nod to the US, especially external attempts to blackmail, contain, blockade, and exert maximum pressure on China. The world, Xi Jinping wrote, has entered a new period of turbulence and change. And the report warns the party and the people against external attempts that, to suppress and contain China that can escalate at any time. He talks of uncertainties and unforeseen factors and black swan and gray rhino events that can occur at any time. And of course, Liz mentioned the unilateralism and protectionism mounting. Uh, he talks about global economic recovery sluggish. And perhaps in a, an oblique nod to the war in Ukraine, he states that regional conflicts and disturbances are frequent. Global issues are becoming more acute. The world has entered a new period of turbulence and change. Now then. This worrisome assessment was continued in high-level post-Congress statements. For example, when Xi Jinping visited the PLA Joint Operations Command Center just last week on November 8th, he was reported by the Chinese media to have told the PLA officers present that there is, quote, increasing instability and uncertainty in our country's security situation. That security word once again. And again, in General Xu Qi Liang's People's Daily editorial from the day before, on the 7th, uh, Xu Qi Liang echoes Xi's assessment, writing that, quote, the factors of instability and unpredictability in our country's national security situation are increasing. Wow. So uh, these are pretty alerting judgments. And if, if these sorts of statements were not striking enough, uh, for those of us who follow CCP jargon, uh, had to have been struck, as I was, by the absence in Xi Jinping's report of two key judgments that have been staples of CCP assessments of security for decades. The first judgment that was missing in action from Xi Jinping's report is an assessment that was made by Deng Xiaoping in the mid-1980s and which was included verbatim in reports going back to the 18th Congress and even, even earlier. So specifically, missing from Xi Jinping's report to the 20th Congress was the judgment that peace and development are the keynote of the times. Instead, Xi's report judges that the deficit in peace, development, security, and governance is growing. The world has reached a crossroads in history and its future will be decided by the peoples of the world. Now, this significant departure from past verbiage is eye-catching because it was Deng Xiaoping's judgment back in the 1980s that the world was in a period of peace and development that provided the Marxist theoretical underpinning for Deng Xiaoping's policies of reform and opening up and which allowed the PLA to be more relaxed about external military threats but that judgment is missing. The second key judgment that is missing from the report is one that analysts have been watching for a while. Uh, that is the usual judgment that, quote, China's development is still in a period of important strategic opportunity, unquote. 
Instead, Xi's report states that our country has entered a period of development in which strategic opportunities, risks, and challenges are concurrent and uncertainties and unforeseen factors are rising. Okay, to sum up and conclude, what are we supposed to make out of all of this? Well, here are a couple of initial thoughts, even as the dust is settling. First, we should not be surprised based on the report and subsequent uh, uh, propaganda blitz. We should not be surprised if the PLA increases the frequency, duration, and perhaps even the scale of its operations around its periphery, wherever they feel there is pressure being placed on PRC sovereignty as they define it. And obviously, this will include the Indian border, the South and East China Sea, the Yellow Sea, and obviously in the vicinity of Taiwan, of course. So I think we need to be prepared for a more active or GGDA, more active PLA uh, in the uh, uh, Indo-Pacific AOR. Uh, second, it is crystal clear that the party is worried about the state of international security affairs in general and worried about China's external security situation in particular. So worried, in fact, that for the first time in probably 40 years, 40 years, the party was not prepared to assert that peace and development remains the keynote of the times. These formulations are not merely theoretical constructs. This new and uncertain assessment is going to provide the context against which the party, which is clearly worried, will make decisions about how much risk to take at home in dealing with domestic challenges. These assessments will inform the direction of Beijing's foreign policies, and they will certainly underwrite and undergird their approaches to military and national security affairs. So I think I'll, I'll stop by, on that note. Thanks. Thank you very much, David. And then last but not least, April, if you're ready, please go ahead. Yes, thank you so much, Emily. Today, I am gonna be addressing what the PRC refers to as, quote, innovation-driven development and national strategic technology forces. Uh, innovation is not a new theme for the 20th Party Congress, but technology and innovation have come into sharp focus as U.S.-China strategic competition has increased and expanded. Um, as Dave mentioned, the Communist Party reports tend to use a great deal of ideological jargon. So I'm going to begin my remarks today with discussing a few broad concepts that are discussed in this report and how those relate to China's overarching technology goals. However, I also want to reinforce what Liz mentioned about the specificity of these reports. The one we are discussing today does not have the type of specific details about goals, plans, and priorities. Those details come out in places such as the five-year plans, the Central Economic Work Conferences, and the two sessions. For example, the outline for the 14th five-year plan has entire sections dedicated to perfecting science and technology innovation, talent innovation, and strengthening national strategic technology. My remarks today reflect those more detailed discussions, but are focused on highlighting the consistencies and the differences in emphasis with the latest Party Congress report. So with that background, I'm gonna start with three broad concepts. Um, the first of those is just the notion of innovation. What are we talking about when we talk about innovation? I'm focused primarily on the type of technological innovation associated with artificial intelligence, quantum computing, and new and emerging technologies that are likely to have major implications for economic systems and or military use. In the official Xinhua release of the report, the party states, quote, we must regard science and technology as our primary productive force, talent as our primary resource, and innovation as our primary driver of growth. However, it's also important to note that in this particular Party Congress report, innovation is also used to describe so-called theoretical innovations. And those are often associated with grand theories of Marxism or so-called um, socialism with Chinese characteristics. Um, so both types of innovation are important, but they are fundamentally different. The second concept is common prosperity. This concept may sound like an innocuous term for economic development, and it is related to economic goals, but it's also more than that. According to Xi Jinping, achieving common prosperity is a defining feature of socialism with Chinese characteristics. 
uh, in some of the official party documents that discuss this concept, they note that the new round of scientific and technological innovation and industrial change has promoted strong economic development, but it's also had a profound impact on employment and income distribution. It is that income distribution that makes common prosperity an important concept to understand in terms of the technology sector. Because the current belief by the Communist Party, at least under Xi Jinping, is that technological advances should benefit the broader Chinese society and not simply support the wealth of a few people. I raise this point because this is the, the terminology that has been used to deal to talk about some elements of what we've been calling the technology crackdown that occurred in China beginning in November 2020. That particular concept of common prosperity and dealing with income distribution has been used to justify the PRC's use of the anti-monopoly law and increased regulation of private sector corporations in China. The third concept that comes up a lot in this report and that relates to technology development is what they quote call high quality development. This ties innovation, talent, and common prosperity all together. In the 2017 Party Congress report, high quality development was only mentioned one time, but Xi Jinping said that as China's economy is transitioning, that quote, this is a pivotal stage. So in the 20th Party Congress report, there is more discussion of this concept, and it is argued in that report that, quote, the principal contradiction facing Chinese society is that between unbalanced and inadequate development and the people's ever-growing needs for a better life. So how do all of these ideological concepts relate to the future of technology and innovation? Uh, first off, the report goes into where has the success been? So the report both focuses on major accomplishments that have been a that have happened recently in China, but it also talks about some of those challenges. So in terms of major accomplishments, they say first, China has grown stronger in basic research and original innovation. China has also joined the ranks of world innovators um, in areas such as artificial intelligence. There's no doubt that a robust ecosystem has developed over the past several decades. In terms of specific accomplishments mentioned in the report, uh, they have quite a, quite a long list. They include manned space flight, lunar and Martian exploration, deep sea and deep earth probes, supercomputers, satellite navigation, quantum information, nuclear power technology, new energy technology, airline manufacturing, and biomedicine. So they, they put front and center a lot of areas where China is making dramatic progress in terms of its own systems and its own technological development. So that, that is definitely highlighted in the report, but the overall tone, as Dave and Liz have both discussed, is there's a lot more concerns in this particular report about the international security environment. And because of that, they also recognize the challenges to their ability to focus on innovation and achieve additional goals. So specifically, the report states that there are, quote, many bottlenecks hindering high quality development and that China's capacity for scientific and technological innovation are not yet strong enough. So the PRC wants to join the ranks of the world's most innovative countries, but wants to do so while sim simultaneously establishing self-reliance and strength in science and technology. Um, this is reflected in earlier 14th uh, five-year plans in terms of increasing the amount of funding that's going to basic research. So this has been identified earlier as an issue it needs to work on, but essentially the, the hope is that China will become both self-reliant and a world leader in technological innovation. So they're related, but there is some tension there in terms of how does China achieve those set of goals. So basically to do that, the Party Congress report says that they need to strengthen basic research, prioritize original innovation, and encourage researchers to engage in free exploration. In the same vein, there's a recognition that major technology firms have a role to play, but they also need to make room for what they call micro, small, and medium technological enterprises. This goes back to what I was talking about earlier in terms of common prosperity. So basically, Xi Jinping has said throughout the last several years that he's not interested in seeing giants like Jack Ma at Alibaba or Pony Ma at Tencent 
get rich if those companies are not also benefiting other parts of society. So in terms of innovation-driven development, there's this recognition that it's just not about making money. It's about achieving more and making sure that those technology priorities support the goals and priorities of the party. So what, what, do, what does the party want? Um, for years now, they have focused on semiconductors, advanced manufacturing, and other critical future technologies, um, and has not been shy about how it wants to be a world leader in innovation in those areas. But what is, what is creating challenges for that? I'm happy to discuss in the Q&A some of the recent export controls that are front and center in the minds of the Chinese leaders. Uh, the Party Congress report explicitly states that, quote, China faces drastic changes in the international landscape, external attempts to blackmail, contain, and blockade. As Dave mentioned, they, they discuss that stuff in the innovation perspective because of the kind of export controls on semiconductors that they are concerned about. They've also recognized, they've watched the sanctions policies on Russia. And in this report, they also mentioned that they are trying to develop quote, mechanisms for countering foreign sanctions, interference, and long-arm jurisdiction. So they, they recognize that technology competition is only set to increase and that they need to be both aware of these changes, self-reliant, and also they want to be a world leader. So there are, there are a combination of goals and priorities in the technology sector that are both challenging, but they're laying out the roadmap of how they want to do that. Um, with that, I will turn it back over and we can go to the moderated discussion. Thank you. Great. Thank you, everyone, for your comments. I, uh, I think one thing that really stood out to me hearing all three of you speak is that I came away from Party Congress absolutely shocked at how comfortable Xi Jinping was showing in a very uncompromising way just how much power he had consolidated. I don't think anyone expected him to show his hand so much and for him to be so comfortable in showing how he would appoint so many of his loyalists to the Politburo. But hearing you three speak, you have listed a quite daunting gamut of challenges that the party faces and that she personally will be seen as responsible for if the party doesn't meet the aspirations it's laid out in its party report. So how do you assess she standing right now? Is he feeling secure? How does the party feel about its ability to meet the targets that it's that it set out somewhat ambiguously after the party congress? Well, uh, yeah, let me let me just make a couple of comments about that. I think uh, this was a report that was characterized, as I said earlier, by both triumphalism and trepidation. Those two contrasting uh, vibes coming out of the same party Congress and party Congress report. Uh, obviously, Xi Jinping spent a good time and the party spent a good time patting themselves on the back for all of the progress they've made at home and abroad since the 10 years, since the inception of the so-called new era, and especially since the five years since the 19th Party Congress. But there's also, I think, a recognition that the international situation, and even the situation at home in China, which allowed for 40 years of, of quick and amazing rise, is now possibly being challenged, that they're entering a period both at home domestically, uh, where they've done as much as they can, and they, they're going to need to move out. I mean, for example, uh, China still needs to put more emphasis on a consumer-driven uh, economy at home as opposed to an export-driven economy. So when Xi Jinping says the global economy is recovery is sluggish, that's a domestic problem for China. So, um, and of course, I already spoke to some of the external uh, concerns that China has. So, so Xi Jinping, I think, is is prepping everybody to to meet their objectives, but telling them that it ain't going to be easy. Struggle, 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 is the term that comes out. And the fact that he took the Politburo to Yan'an <laughs> right after the Congress, uh, you know, should give us a, a pretty a pretty good sense for the fact that that he is girded to do what needs to be done 
but he and the party recognize it's not going to be easy. Over. Yeah, I would like to add to that. I think that that he puts on such a, a face of bravado, but at the root of it, when I read this speech, I see a lot of insecurity and uh, fear about about his own regime. We see him uh, monopolizing uh, the political power in the system, but he sees a lot of threats to that political power. And as Dave mentioned, this has to do with his reading of the external situation, that these external threats have the potential to upset what he's trying to build in terms of uh, party's primacy and his own hold on power at home. And then uh, he's faced with these situations, uh, zero COVID that, how does he end that? Uh, sluggish economic growth, um, which has always been the legitimizing, since economic growth has always been the legitimizing factor, performance being the only metric uh, for for the Chinese public, so with that, you know, so that leaves him with nationalism as a, a as a force to reinforce his his uh, rule, which is concerning, and and uh, supports what Dave said about the likelihood of increased activity um, in defense of uh, of Chinese interests. The only thing I would add, I appreciate Emily, you mentioning that the confidence, because I don't think there's any question that in terms of who Xi Jinping has appointed around him, that he has confidence in his his leadership and his ability to continue moving forward. I think the challenge, though, is, uh, for instance, on the economic and technological side, there's not a lot of indication there that that the moves they need to make to be that world leader are reflected in the leadership selections that we see now. And at the end of the day, the technology sector is incredibly vibrant in China. And in some ways, the more you unleash that, the more likely you are to achieve those goals. But if, if they want to just reassert government control of so many sectors, uh, that, that may be a problem. We've seen it in the semiconductor work. They have put a lot of money into funds to fund, you know, fund advanced research in semiconductors. And they, they're making progress, but probably not as much progress as the party would have liked to have seen. Hmm. That's interesting. Let's talk about then um, your read on the abilities of the people that she has appointed to top party positions and also in state bureaucratic positions to realize the kind of policy and military objectives that he's laid out. Because Xi Jinping has showed himself very, very adept at building up power, at working within very um, flexible, shall we say, party institutions and rules that are made to be broken to a mass control. But when it comes to actual um, policy, sometimes you see him unable to make that change. So we've seen this with the property sector where he's tried to rein in speculation and debt and has had to walk that back. Uh, China still has been, you know, they've been debating a property tax for, for, for years, decades even, and have just not been able to make that happen. Speaking of tax, you know, there's just no functioning tax collection system in China still, despite it being one of the world's biggest economies. So when it comes to actually like the nitty gritty of, say, building up a native uh, domestic semiconductor supply chain or making good on military modernization, David, what where do you see China in, in, in that? And does the party Congress and the rhetoric there then translate into concrete improvements on the ground? Yeah, so um, I think as many of our audience understand, uh, the party Congress is just the beginning, really, of the political year for China, that uh, we won't know who will be getting which state positions until the, the, two, the two Congresses or the National People's Congress, probably in the spring of 2023. And at that time, we'll have a better sense for who's going to have which portfolios on the state side. It's also worth pointing out, uh, April mentioned it, but I think it's worth underscoring that the 14th five-year plan that was generated back at the fifth plenum of the 19th Central Committee in November of 2020, did I get that right, April? Uh, uh, at the, the at the fifth plenum in, in 2020, the 14th five-year plan was generated, and that is where a lot of the very specific programs and funding allocations 
have already been made. There was a question in the chat box already about uh, will resources be put against this urgency for military modernization. Uh, given the opaqueness of the Chinese defense budget, I certainly can't say for sure. But if they have, it has already been allocated inside the 14th five-year plan and then with plus ups possible after that. So. Um, and of course, uh, the party has uh, the great ability to declare victory whenever it chooses to. For example, it was also at the fifth plenum of the uh, 19th uh, Central Committee back in November 2020 that the PLA declared victory over its goal of becoming fully mechanized. So whether they have or not is uh, for honest men and women to to debate if they can get the data, that is. But uh, so publicly the goals in the public domain the goals are sort of squishy and so they can choose to declare victory at any time but what's happening behind the curtain behind the screen is is something else over the other thing i would add is one i'm glad you mentioned um emily that the taxes and stuff like that i'm actually reading about a book right now about tax reform um because that's been a huge issue and a huge challenge um, and so what often happens is there's a discussion of, oh, it's all about resources, but on technological innovation, yes, you obviously, you need the resources to go forth and, and do this kind of work, but just throwing money at the problem isn't always successful because that actually ties directly to what's going on with the anti-corruption campaign. Because what we've also seen is a lot of people take this money and yes, some is going towards you know, the companies that are actually doing the technological innovation, but some of it's just getting spent elsewhere. And that's why you've seen the, the anti-corruption campaign round up a lot of different people in different places because the money was was not being put to its best use. Um, in terms of specific goals in the 14th five-year plan, they do talk about increasing the amount of funding for basic research, which obviously is really important to, to make those strides. But according to, if those numbers are accurate, the goals are still less than what is spent on R&D and basic research in the US, Japan, other advanced industrial economies. So there's still probably work that can be done, but it's also how do you allocate that? And you know, there, we can all debate whether or not government allocated resources is the best way to do innovation. Um, they have made it clear in the last three to four years that the, they want the government more involved in directing that, but whether or not that's going to be what's successful remains to be seen. Elizabeth, did you want to jump in? Well, I'll just say that that one uh, point that comes out in this report is the balance between security and development is is uh, has been upset. So as Dave mentioned that for since Deng Xiaoping, the priority had been on development and now we're going to see uh, a new priority on security. And so what that means, as April said, is we'll, we'll see a greater role of the state in promoting technology, not uh, for economic reasons necessarily, but for security reasons. And so that has a, a different impact on, on the overall development of, of the state. Um, and one interesting uh, detail to watch is in terms of the budget, will there be more funding to uh, public security, to, to um, internal security, or to uh, external security threats. Because that, I mean, the, the public security um, funding number had been exceeding the, the, uh, the military security uh, number to the extent that we, we have a, a good grasp of those facts. And, and of course, it was also interesting, thanks for that, Liz, that the Party Congress report itself talked about the problems or the, the challenge of internal hostile forces, domestic hostile forces, subversive forces. Uh, and, and again, it's great that Liz highlighted this, this uh, security development paradigm that Xi Jinping has developed. This is not new. If you've been reading the, the various volumes of the governance of China by Xi Jinping, which you can pick up at your local borders, I'm sure, uh, then, uh, then, then this concept of, of security has been looming large for the past couple of years. And, and most observers of, of the, uh, the China scene, folks who, who study these reports, were quick to point out that this is the first time that a political report to a party Congress had a separate section on holistic security. Uh, there was nothing particularly new in there, but they 
apparently they took all of these statements that had been in previous reports and other documents and put them under its own separate section uh, for the first time. So it shows you what's, what's on Xi Jinping's mind and what's on the party's mind. One thing I'm sensing is that things are going to be hard. And this is what Xi Jinping stressed over and over again in his, his, his speech elucidating the party report, that they've set their objectives, but to get there, there might be difficult times ahead. And to put this simply, and many people before me have said this, but a lot of the party's legitimacy has been staked on the fact that they've might made people's lives better over the last couple of decades. So where where do you see the sources of party legitimacy, legitimacy coming from if in objective terms, perhaps life in China gets a little bit more difficult going forward. And what implications might that have for, say, China's foreign policy, its military modernization, uh, or its economic prospects and engagement with the rest of the world? Well, uh, it, it's still too early to tell, but I, I would say that uh, we've seen in the last few weeks that uh, Xi, Xi Jinping, I think, is going to be uh, trying to make nice with Europe uh, because Europe is so critical to China economically as a source of foreign direct investment, as a source, uh, at least in the past, of technology. And with the pathway to those things to the U.S. becoming more and more difficult, uh, Beijing is going to have to be looking to other parts of the world. So we've seen him take his trip to uh, to Saudi Arabia, the Middle East. Uh, we've seen him receive Olaf Scholz and, um, and others uh, in Beijing. Uh, and, and of course, uh, the war in Ukraine has, has really had a, a terrible impact on China-EU relations. And so Xi Jinping is going to have to, and the party is going to have to do some, some uh, quick work to try to repair those relations, to find those alternative sources. So yeah, uh, I'm sure Liz and, uh, and April have some views on this. Yeah, I agree with uh, with what Dave said about Europe. I think uh, they had um, they had an ambition to decouple Europe from the U.S. and and encourage Europeans' so-called strategic autonomy and so on. But but the Ukraine Russian war in Ukraine has really upended that goal. And and the way I see it, China is focusing. Um, on this global security initiative to, to try to go over the heads of, of, of uh, heads of state and uh, go directly uh, to the developing world and where they've had more success in the UN, for example, and with the Belt and Road, and, you know, in some parts like in Africa, for example, or in Latin America, and to um, talk about China's role in global issues. And, and so I think it's interesting that the national security um, agenda includes uh, includes some of these global domains like deep sea, polar, um, space. Uh, so China wants to be a global player, not just a regional player, and um, uh, is trying to make a case that China should have a seat at the table and gain stature uh, for its participation in global rulemaking. So, so I think that's in addition to nationalism, which I think is going to be another way that that um, the party retains its legitimacy when uh, when uh, young people in China now are going to live worse than their parents, uh, probably because of uh, rising uh, property prices, difficulties in employment, um, COVID lockdowns are upsetting uh, pe people protesting in Guangzhou. I mean, there, there are a lot of sources of dissatisfaction. So maybe by this global security initiative, she can promote China's stature uh, at a time when opinion of China has been declining uh, precipitously, uh, as the Pew reports have, have shown uh, in most places, except perhaps Russia and a few other uh, developing countries. I also think they want to promote national pride and sort of what they are achieving. I mean, Liz mentioned sort of deep sea. I mean, when 
when they send a deep sea submersible down to do research and scientific data gathering, you know, they really play this stuff up in the media. So I do think they want the, the population, the society to, to be proud of what China has achieved and whether it's space exploration, going to the moon, um, the satellite navigation, some of these technological systems that they have developed when, when those are launched, there is a big effort to sort of put forth that this is something in addition to you know, becoming a moderately prosperous society and growing, this is something that the Chinese people should be proud of. Um, and as I mentioned in my remarks about self-reliance, some of the push under Xi Jinping has to say, we don't want to fully rely on, on the West or on U.S. technology. Like, look, we can do this ourselves and maybe we'll do it differently, but that's something that can, they can take pride in. Yeah, and um, yeah, this discussion or the, the comments of Liz in, in April sort of bring to mind that uh, the party traditionally sees uh, domestic policy and foreign policy as intertwined. There, there is not just a separate domestic policy and a separate foreign policy. They talk about the Liang Dachu, the two big issues, internal issues and external issues that are all linked. So in order to achieve the party's domestic agenda, they're going to have to come with, with a foreign policy agenda that can achieve it. And the problem is that the foreign policy agenda that is linked to the domestic agenda is running into friction. And in many ways, uh, the party has had to absorb three body blows in the last few years. The first was the rapid, relatively rapid deterioration in US-China relations because the US, if it chooses to, can make the world a very difficult place for China. Uh, the second body blow was COVID. Not necessarily the international opprobrium associated with their initial handling of the outbreak, but instead the deleterious impact on their economy, which they're still dealing with. And of course, the third blow was Russia's war with Ukraine. Uh, and uh, uh, while the Chinese uh, uh, strategic communications machine continues to show support, and although they claim neutrality, this was probably not something that the party was happy about. Uh, it it, it under, undermined relations with Europe. It put uh, uh, Beijing in a bind between its partnership with Russia and its foreign policy principles. I mean, people forget you. China's first aircraft carrier was the, the Liaoning was the Varyag purchased from who? Ukraine. All right. So, so, uh, so there are problems within, there are problems without. And again, this is why Xi Jinping and the party is taking a grit your teeth and strident approach to, to uh, what they're about to uh, seek to achieve. Over. Great. We are about to go into the audience Q&A section of the talk. There are a couple of questions already in the queue. I will start uh, consolidating them and I'll, and I'll try to ask a few all at once, but please do drop more questions in um, because I will start asking those questions for you now. There's, um, so I'm looking at the existing Q&A and we've got a lot of uh, questions about the PLA, about China's military modernization. So uh, we have someone named Michael McDevitt asking about the notion that the PLA is going to be more operationally active. Uh, where do you think they might be more operationally active? Uh, and are they going to be expanding beyond their current presences, say, in the East or South China Sea? Yeah. Hi, Mike. Uh, th thanks for that. Um, they're already active on their periphery. <laughs> Let's make no mistake about it. And I think that the verbiage in the report was an endorsement and an encouragement to keep being active on their periphery in the three near seas uh, and defending their, their, uh, uh, their equities on the Western border with India. So uh, I don't have the crystal ball to tell you what it's gonna look like, Mike. But I think uh, we need to be prepared for uh, and not be surprised if we see more frequent exercises, uh, different mixes of, of joint forces as they continue to experiment with and try to perfect their new joint command and control uh, relationships and authorities. Uh, I think we're going to see uh, 
the PLA continue to send peacekeeping operators out to the third world in support of UN PKOs and, of course, their operations in, in uh, Djibouti, their uh, so-called anti-piracy operations at this point. And, of course, the, the big question is, you know, is the, is the PLA going to develop more logistics facilities or bases around the world? This is a question that people are debating right now. So, uh, so I, I just think we need to be braced to see a more active PLA more active PLA. Over. Anyone else want to jump in? I, I might use this chance actually to wrap in a couple of questions that people are asking about uh, Taiwan and uh, another person who is asking about the PLA's footprint abroad or forward presence in other regions after party Congress. There was a really interesting short piece in Foreign Affairs magazine today that polled a number of foreign policy experts, I think many of whom we on this panel might know personally or follow their work. And the question was, is strategic ambiguity, this ambiguity about whether or not the U.S. would come to Taiwan's defense if China were to invade, is it still effective? Or is the, a policy of strategic clarity definitively saying that the U.S. would come and defend Taiwan more useful? Um, I, I wonder, uh, so, so one person has asked about, um, do, you, do, do the panelists perceive the party's uh, window of opportunity to invade Taiwan as narrowing, given the number of uh, internal and external challenges they face? But I think within that question is this presumption of how sure are we that the, P that, that, that the Chinese Communist Party does indeed one day want to invade Taiwan? And depending on what you think on that, we have very, very, I think, different prescriptions of what what the U.S. and Taiwan should do going forward. So, I, I mean, I guess I, I want to pose that question to you. Do you do you see that window of opportunity narrowing for the PRC? PRC? And and given that, uh, what actions should parties take, or in taking a policy of you know strategic clarity or absolutely naked deterrence without much nuance, perhaps we risk provoking the theory, thing we fear the most, which is war. Maybe I'll start off here. I, th I think that, that uh, the, the window um, has to be defined um, um, in, in a greater detail. So, so there are these markings these, that, that Dave outlined in terms of the modernization of the PLA. And so that's a, that's a kind of time frame um, that he'll, I'm sure he'll talk about. Uh, but, but there are some political factors that I'll address, like the next elections in Taiwan. I think that's an important consideration because if the if a DPP candidate is reelected, that inc that changes the dynamic uh, for uh, for Beijing, where you you would have you know for the third time a DPP uh, leader in Taiwan. What does that mean in terms of uh, you know the consolidation of of uh, viewpoints in favor of the status quo in Taiwan? Uh, so that's that's one factor, and then. Uh, the the other um, political factors have to do with China's international environment. Um, how what is the state of U.S. China relations? Uh, what is uh, China's standing uh, globally? Uh, what is Taiwan standing? Because we've seen another con unintended consequence of this Russian war on Ukraine was increased support for Taiwan globally, especially in Europe, um, and. And so what does that mean for China's ability to carry out its goals? So, so there might have a, you know, a, a time frame in terms of their operational readiness, but they have to be sure, uh, going back to this issue of political legitimacy, that they can actually successfully complete this mission, or else this is the end of, of, the, of Communist Party rule in China, perhaps, because, if you, because uh, she has, has called this the core of the core interests. And so if China tries and fails, then, then that's disastrous. Um, so, so I think there are, there are constraints on this window, um, I would say. Yeah, just on the uh, issue of strategic clarity versus strategic ambiguity, a debate that's been raging amongst the chattering classes uh, in the China business for the last couple of years. Uh, st strategic strategic clarity gives you 
no deterrent power in my view. The, the, the PLA and the party decided uh, quite a couple of decades ago that any attempt to uh, take on a Taiwan conflict means a conflict with the US. That is a planning assumption. So by becoming uh, uh, very clear in the US that you would uh, come to that defense, that has, in my view, it, others may disagree, it has very little deterrent power. But, but st what strategic clarity does do is that it potentially ties the hands of the president and our, our national leaders in the Congress and beyond uh, to make decisions at the time based on context. So uh, I, I would want our national leaders in, in all the appropriate branches to have the maximum flexibility possible to do what's best for the United States. Uh, and so I, I still think that uh, becoming strategically clear about what we would do and when we would do it and under what conditions we would do it uh, ties their hands and it has no effect on potentially on, on the PLA. Over. The only thing I would add to that is that, I mean, I do think there's a recognition that that time is not on Beijing's side. I mean, I, at the end of the day, I don't believe that they've ever wanted to solve that problem militarily. That's not the ideal solution. But obviously, the trends are not in their favor. Um, uh, actually, I have a colleague, Shirley Lin, who's written a whole book on Taiwanese identity and how that's been evolving. And I think that's really important to keep in mind. And I think I actually think more recently, we've actually seen Beijing recognize that. I think I think five years ago, they thought this would all be resolved peacefully, that, you know, they'll just come back to the motherland, those sorts of things. And I think actually those changes across the strait have become more clear. Um, and I bring it up because in terms of the context of the broader question about PLA operational deployments, um, you know, they are still more active in other regions, but they're still more active in trying to get people to switch. We saw in Oceania in 2019, the Solomon Islands in Kiribati switched diplomatic recognition from Taiwan to, uh, to the PRC. Um, and that was a big deal in the PRC. I mean, most a lot of people would argue that these are relatively small countries. Does this matter? But that was a big win. And if you look at now, um, I'm about to put it in the chat, a colleague and I, Christopher Cairns, have written about PLA views of Oceania. Um, it's it, they are doing more operational deployments. They are they are becoming more active in those regions. So some of these issues about the near seas and the far seas are interrelated. Yeah, if if I if I could jump in again, uh, uh, Emily. So on this Taiwan issue, before before the Party Congress and the months leading up to the Party Congress, there were rumors uh, flying around the uh, China watching community and also in the. Uh, some in some places in China as well, that the party Congress was going to result in some sort of so-called new line for Taiwan work. Uh, and so everybody was waiting to see whether there would be anything radically different. But um, for me, though, that possibility was quashed in the aftermath of House Speaker Pelosi's visit within, what, three to five days, they issued a new white paper on China's approach to Taiwan uh, once again, it was all about uh, the uh, one country, two systems, which, of course, is a non-starter uh, in Taiwan, uh, not just, you know, pan green, but, but also across blue, uh, proving to me or at least suggesting to me uh, that that Beijing still remains the prisoner of a dead man's formula, uh, Deng Xiaoping's one country, two systems. And they've got to figure out how to come up with something more creative than that, because that is just a non-starter. Over. Yeah, I'd just like to add, um, I think this issue of strategic clarity versus ambiguity is also kind of an old issue now. Um, in light of the war in Ukraine, we've seen the debate shift over to how to pre-position uh, material support, how to, to provide timely aid, you're looking at the example of, of Ukraine and uh, talk about how to make Taiwan into more of a porcupine that's uh, harder to, um, to invade or to, to take over. So, so I agree with David that the clarity point of view is, is one that gives the U.S. less flexibility. And it also uh, increases the pressure on U.S. political leaders to follow through because if they don't follow through, then, then we have a deterrence problem with China as well. Um, so I, I think that the, the debate has moved a little bit beyond uh, this, this clarity versus ambiguity issue. And, and also the, 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 
I disagree a little bit with April on the diplomatic rec recognition issue. I think that for Taiwan, these are these are important, but I think it has attracted a lot more global support than before, um, especially in in European countries. And we've seen uh, Ukrainian uh, uh, politicians visiting Taiwan, and you know uh, Lithuania uh, um, boosting its presence. And and so I think Taiwan. Um, might mourn these uh, diplomatic switchovers, but feels can feel more confident that it has a broader base of support than previously. Yeah, this uh, this idea of uh, what are the implications of Ukraine on on thinking in Beijing, uh, this is something that uh, we cannot have uh, very good visibility on at the moment, and I think that it's going to be quite a few months before. Uh, PLA and others in the party uh, start to draw their lessons. And one does hear about debates about uh, the implications. Uh, some, some realize that hmm, uh, maybe this war business is harder than it looks. Uh, I mean, imagine, imagine how disappointing the Russian performance at the operational and tactical level and even the strategic level has been for, uh, for observers in, in the PRC. You know, in, in the post-Soviet uh, Russia, uh, friends in the PRC used to say, well, at least they've got a lot of resources and a great military. And, you know, we were seeing the challenges that Moscow is having. So this, this cannot help but give moment for reflection, thought, and detailed study, certainly in the PLA, as to what what the implications of this are as they think about their own situation. And I would say that another, uh, another piece of collateral damage for Beijing as a result of Russia's war in Ukraine has been, I think, increased attention globally to Taiwan's plight, if not empathy for their situation. How long that'll last and whether it translates into anything tangible is anybody's guess. But all of a sudden, the Taiwan issue uh, became uh, uh, something of the flavor of the day uh, after in the first few months of the war. So uh, th there are just no good outcomes for Beijing out of Moscow's uh, adventurism. Over. I'm going to combine a question asked early on and more recently. We have someone named Steve Sachs who a while ago asked if any of you anticipate any changes to China's military civil fusion concept, given what you've seen in the 20th Party Congress report on uh, and its priorities on innovation and technology. And, and I, I want to throw that forward a little bit, um, uh, which is, um, you know, I wonder how that, how the civil military fusion concept is impacted, if at all, on the U.S. semiconductor bans mm -hmm. and um, entity list designations that were announced right before party Congress. Um, and I think this pairs well with another question asked by someone named Nick Bradford. Um, about whether she senior appointments are, even though them being loyalists are actually quite competent and capable. Other people have pointed out rightfully so that many people who are appointed to the Politburo come from engineering, logistics, or equipment backgrounds and seem quite well poised to address some of the uh, technology deficits that China still faces and probably will continue to face given the US technology constraints on the PRC. I'll start there. I mean, the short answer to the military civil fusion question is no, I don't see any major changes. I think that will remain a policy in place um, in the reporting that has come out about innovation driven development after before and after the party report. It basically says this is still a component of it. But I think at the report itself, that kind of language has been downplayed. And I think that's a purposeful choice because I think there is a recognition that it is exactly that program and that concept that has started to initiate a lot of the export controls. I think, I think once that concept got sort of well known in DC policy circles and in the United States and an understanding, it made the idea of dual use technology really problematic for the US. If, if you don't know who your end user is, it becomes very difficult to you know, give licenses or review licenses, there was there pretty much the direction that has gone is there's a presumption 
that it will go to the military if any technology goes to China. Actually, explicitly in the October 7th regulations that came out from the Department of Commerce's Bureau of Industry and Security that talks about the semiconductor export controls, a lot of that is mentioned, is that is that this idea of the, the sort of old thinking on this no longer applies. Um, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan has given several speeches about the old way for the U.S. to think about export controls don't don't apply anymore either, that we're in a fundamentally different era. Um, in one of his Jake Sullivan's speeches, he talks about the sliding scale versus relative advantage. And it's the idea that you don't know where the end users of certain products are going to go in China. And thus, the U.S. is now having to take a somewhat different approach to how it protects its technological edge. And this and this was uh, one of the reasons why the, the previous CFIUS uh, Committee on Foreign Investment in the U.S. system was uh, really tightened up into the new FIRMA system. So uh, great, great concerns about leakage of uh, dual-use technologies going to foreign militaries. And of course, it also uh, reminds us that uh, we had, uh, we had uh, the CATS Act as well, which uh, put sanctions on, on uh, uh, entities or persons that uh, uh, support Russian defense industries. And, and interestingly enough, uh, one of the new members of the Central Military Commission who possibly could become the new Minister of Defense is under CATSA sanctions since 2018. So that'll make for great sport if, uh, if that individual, I believe that would be uh, 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 Li Shangfu, General Li Shangfu, former director of the CMC Equipment Development Department, uh, who is now on the Central Military Commission and possibly a future MND. We won't know until the National People's Congress, but he could be under U.S. sanctions for all we know. Over. I'll just say a word about the loyalist issue. I think the, the, the problem isn't that the new appointees might not be competent. Um, it's that they might be so beholden to Xi that they would be unlikely to tell him any different opinions, alternative views of of policies, bad news about policies, and, and uh, the top leadership becomes an echo chamber, which could encourage uh, faulty decision making. So that, that's a concern. And then you also have uh, the, the possible uh, Prime Minister Li Qiang, who is connected to the two month lockdown in Shanghai. And so how do you get rid of zero COVID if you have uh, your prime minister who is enforcing it. Um, and so so the, it's not really just about competence. It's about uh, the type of leadership and whether or not this leadership will actually provide good advice uh, to Xi. And that really speaks to, to a certain degree to how the Xi Jinping era has, has affected uh, the dungest assessment of what Chinese leadership should be. Uh, the idea of a collective leadership with loyal opposition, people having different views, uh, this, is, this seems to be uh, gone by the wayside, although we can never look into that, that black hole. And of course, uh, in the past, uh, the, con the cons consultations with party elders, uh, I have no idea what was going on with Hu Jintao, but that was a bad optic for party elder, elder consultation. Uh, and so, so the Xi government starts to at least feel a lot like the Putin government, and we've seen how how those kinds of uh, governance systems come up with uh, bad decisions. So we should be pretty worried about that. Over. How do you guys feel? Do you want one more question, or yeah, we've got about five ten minutes left. So I'll I'll wrap up by by uh, mushing together two questions, one from Bruce Powers about the limits, the scope of the PRC's quest for international prestige, and another person who asks, is that quest for prestige uh, translating to China intending to take over the US as a global military power? I'll just add in before you guys start, start answering that last question that here at the G20, of course, President Biden and Xi Jinping had a meeting about whether or not the two countries could coexist. And if so, what might that bilateral relationship look like? Obviously, we're lacking concrete details and there needs to be follow up. But I wonder how that is going to work when you look at the party report and you look at the priorities, the security priorities put out by the, the security strategy and defense strategy from the U.S., 
which are quite clear and in many ways contradictory. And I don't think that the two countries are, uh, given, given how rigid at least those priorities are from both countries, is there space for coexistence and what might that look like? I think well, I'll start. Yeah, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Go, oh, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say the. I, I'm glad you brought up the rigidity. I mean, I think I think I do a lot of work on China's foreign policy in other regions, most recently in the Pacific Island countries, and they those countries understand China's concerns. They understand the U.S. concerns. I think there is obviously tension in the national security strategies of each country. But at the end of the day, much of the rest of the world is saying there are issues, though, that we need to talk about, and it's climate change. Um, and so many countries recognize the distinct differences, but in the international sphere, basically a lot of countries are like, you do have to coexist, that you do have to figure out how to solve these problems. And you guys may not like each other or may not agree on most issues, but there has to be at least some issues, climate change being the most prominent, but there are other issues as well, where at least those conversations are being had. Those aren't gonna be easy or simple conversations, but they do need to be occurring. Um on the prestige issue, I think China has reason to be proud of, of some of its accomplishments, you know, especially in the technology area. Um, but other countries do have concerns about them. Personally, I just came back from Kazakhstan, uh, where I was spending a month on a Fulbright, and there was a lot of discussion of China's digital uh, Silk Road and would how would Kazakhstan participate in in it, because on the one hand, wants the technology and China pro can provide an attractive package. On the other hand, what does that mean about data sovereignty? Who is going to control Kazakhstan's data? And so I think this is, this shows that there's even in uh, neighboring countries, uh, there are some in developing countries, there are concern about the impact of China's quest for prestige and its global reach. But there's also opportunities for the US there and the EU to reach out to other countries and to provide some alternatives. So China's trying to create its own um, uh, imprimatur on, on uh, global governance and global public goods, but we also have our own uh, models that we can, we can uh, do a better job of showcasing and promoting. Do you want the last word, David? You're muted. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, it's, uh, you know, we're, we're in a really uh, difficult bilateral relationship. This is the toughest bilateral relationship we've had since renormalization uh, in, in 1979. And I think that the Chinese realize it, the US realizes it, uh, domestic politics in both countries are becoming uh, pretty focused on this problem. And uh, the problem is not whether or not we're going to coexist. The, the issue is how we're going to coexist. Uh, are we going to be able to uh, maintain, as the U.S. administration uh, likes to say, guardrails? Or as the Chinese would say, will we be able to put a floor under how, how far down this relationship can plunge? And it's of tremendous significance, not just for Beijing and Washington, but for the rest of, of the Indo-Pacific and for the rest of the world. And so uh, we can only hope, we can only hope that the recent meeting between uh, President Xi Jinping and President Biden is going to uh, possibly start uh, a new series of uh, discussions so we can talk some of these things out. But uh, uh, this is a really, really uh, bad situation. And I would point out, this didn't happen overnight. Uh, this, this started by the second Obama administration. Things were already starting to get dicey. And so here we are. Well, on, on that happy note, I think it's time for us to, to wrap it up. Uh, I want to thank uh, my colleagues at CNA, April Herlevy and, and uh, Liz Wishnick for uh, their contributions today. I especially want to thank Emily uh, for uh, not just for uh, her moderation today, but for the work she does uh, every day 
that I tune in on my drive in or my drive home. Uh, we're, we're counting on you, Emily, uh, to be on the ground there where most of us can't at the moment and to, uh, to give, us, uh, give us those special insights that you're so well known for. So we thank you for that. And for those of you out in the audience, uh, thanks ever so much for spending so much time with us on a Thursday. Uh, we really appreciate your participation and I hope that you'll look uh, at the CNA website and look for more opportunities to attend this terrific uh, national security seminar that uh, some of our folks do run. So, so with that, uh, Nick, I know you're out in the background there somewhere. Uh, I think that's probably a wrap.